coming out this evening. You guys can find your way and make your way to your seats. I will get started here. We've got a wonderful program this evening. So. Just giving a little extra time this evening for everyone to find their way to their seats. All right. So we've got some upcoming events coming up. Uh, first up, uh, Cherokee Castle Tour. I was just informed that this one has filled up. So thank you everyone that signed up. So if you want to go, you can get yourself onto the uh, waiting list for the tour. Uh, next up is the Farm... Farm... Oh, too far. Farming, family farming and fermentation. Uh, this will be held at the Cheese Ranch. It's being put on by Metro Districts. So you can sign up through the Metro Districts website. It's coming up on October 2nd at 6 p.m. Or you can go back to our tour table and uh, Nancy and Group will help you sign up there. Uh, our program coming up in November is uh, the Birth of Liberty and the U.S. Military. That's coming up November 16th. Uh, coming up next month, we're going to be doing John Denver, the man uh, of the world, uh, and we're back at Southbridge for, or Southbridge for that one. So, welcome, we'll look forward to seeing you all there. Uh, right now we're also thinking that uh, our December meeting was actually getting so close to Christmas this year that we're probably going to opt out of having a December meeting. Uh, we are going to have a board meeting and people are welcome to come help us uh, define what we're going to do for next year and what our big goals are for next year. We've accomplished a lot this year, and we plan on accomplishing, hopefully, as much next year also. Uh, you can check out what we're doing on our website, the Facebook page, or the YouTube channel. Uh, thanks to everyone who helped with Highlands Ranch Days, and thanks to the management for putting on Highlands Ranch Days. That's always a wonderful event, uh, so thank you for all of our volunteers, the mansion, and everyone else. Uh, we have upcoming RTD tours of the Lion King. There's only four tickets left, and that's for November 5th. So hurry up and sign up if you want. Our volunteer program, thank you for all the volunteers. You saw a lot of them at the front door. We have breeders, refreshments set up, uh, people that help with stuff and takedown. And we actually have the winning name, which was the Wranglers. Is Alan Pearson here tonight? Uh, would you like to come up and receive your certificate? Of our volunteer program, please uh, find out how to sign up. And we also have new volunteer badges that should be coming out next uh, month. So work has gone in to make the volunteer badges look a little bit nicer for everyone who's helped to volunteer at the Historical Society. And those are our wonderful volunteers from last month. So uh, just a word for all the volunteers from this month. Please hang around a little bit after the meeting so we can get your photo and put it up next month. <laughs> all right. Uh, also, I'm, we're working on our history book of Highlands Ranch. Uh, the ones we're trying to find is some early photos of the Griggs Farm Ranch House. Uh, if anyone has photos of Dad Clark or the Dad Clark Ranch, and anything from the failing Douglas Investment Ranch back in backcountry, those are places where I've gone through multiple historical societies and the library and everyone else, and no one seems to really have photos of these areas. So if anyone has these available, I'd love to be able to try to get those scanned into their historical record. Uh, because the homestead is a key part and a key part of the history of Highlands Ranch. All right. And with that, uh, our speaker for tonight is Art Cook. Yay. Apparently, he's having so much fun, he just needed to make his way up here. <laughs> Go back to a little uh, road wash first. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so much. I've been looking forward to this so much that I forgot everything I was going to say. 
so, yeah, <laughs> my wife. <laughs> okay, so I guess I start by showing where our discussion subject tonight being Highlands Ranch, and it's going to be between the period there of 1980 and 1988. Uh, I call it the Great 80s, the period of the Great 80s. And of course, the Shibio Company uh, bought the property back in 1978. 78. And uh, February what? Jan January 10th. January 10th. February 10th. That's right. Anyway, we started, they did, they did the preliminary plan and thought, let's go ahead and have a cattle operation as well. And of course, there's a little bit about me, and so we'll switch to the next one real quick. <laughs> Perhaps, uh, when I joined Mission Mail Company, it was in 1973. There's history in that, but that's for another day. Uh, I was in the community relations function, uh, working with people mostly, and events and activities and things of that nature. And that was really, uh, what I say, Jim Tepper's forecast of what makes uh, Highlands Ranch, Mission Viejo, Elisa Viejo, those planned communities so successful. Getting the residents involved in the activities, getting them involved in their communities. And Jim didn't want to do it, so he hired me to do it. We go ahead and uh, we, uh, we relocated, uh, my wife and I, to, uh, then to Highlands Ranch in 1979 to do it all over again, I thought. My gosh, I didn't do it well enough the first time, so let's do it, give them a chance to do it again the second time. So we came here and I uh, was told that I was hired to do something, but I apparently wasn't qualified for it. So I was, look at him now, yeah, that's, that's the guy who hired me right here, Joe Denver. And so, yeah, and so he, uh, can I interrupt No, not at this time, because I'm on a time schedule here. <laughs> and there'll be, an, at the end, maybe they'd get in for questions and answers if you have a question of me. Anyway, it goes on, and uh, we relocated here to Highlands Ranch in 1979. It was a time uh, when the, the, the development plan had now been pretty well completed. And uh, I was hired as for community relations, and ranch manager. Now he'll tell you I was for office services and personnel and stuff like that. But that didn't work. I was going back to California, if that's what it was. So I came in and, and uh, community relations, my real function. Previous experience, I was a naval supply officer in 58 to 61. And then uh, we decided to stay in California. And uh, we were there, I was with the North American Rockwell, which was the name of the company, North American Aviation at the time, became North American Rockwell and Rockwell Corporation. And, and uh, then uh, along with them, the last four years with them, I moved to Mission Viejo. And four years later, I apparently made a, I won't say it, uh, enough where I, I was going to be hired to talk to community organizations and groups. Okay. This is why. Why is uh, why would we conduct a cattle operation? What would what would be the reason for conducting a cattle operation? Now we did it both here and in California at an operation at a facility property called Aliso Viejo. It's only right across the freeway from Mission Viejo, and it was about 6,600 acres. That is when Jim Teffer called me on the phone one afternoon at about two o'clock and said, uh, Art, we have just closed escrow on the Moulton Ranch, then the name of Elisa Viejo. And I want you to go over there and be the ranch manager. Here I am, public relations, community relations, you know. And I, and my reply was, Jim, I only have two questions. Where is Elisa, where is uh, Moulton Ranch, Elisa Viejo, which we were gonna call it, and what does the ranch manager do? <laughs> and that was all I had to do he said there's a third item, but apparently I didn't pay any attention to that either. Yeah. Which how much was, am I going to be paid? How much am I going to be paid? <laughs> yeah, I had to take a drop in salary. <laughs> <laughs> so we went over there, and uh, uh, of course the best reason is to put your use, put your property to beneficial use right in the beginning. Don't worry about 
uh, five years from now or ten years from now because it's going to change, as did Highlands Ranch, as did Elisa Villa, as did Highlands Ranch, as I say. So uh, the best way to do that, easy way, as you'll see in a couple other slides, it's great property for ranching, for cattle operations, or for farming. We weren't farmers, so it was been and has been for years and years uh, cattle ranch operations, and we then therefore just essentially continued it. Now there are also, being a developer, tax benefits, agricultural tax benefits that we were able to enjoy. I didn't have to get into any of that. I was going to be the ranch manager of it. I didn't, fortunately, we had financial people and things like that uh, who did all of that. And so I just knew that they existed. And I never did figure out how those, much those benefits were because I would slave and slave every year, like every ragged ranchman would, to come up with a budget that would work. And I'd work and I'd just get it a little above break even. And never, I forgot all about this that the company was really beneficial, benefiting from. Of course, it also is a time for us to be able to maintain the facilities, the ranch facility here. Oh my gosh, I'm looking out over the mountains and the red sky that I remember 30 years ago. Uh, uh, sunsets in Colorado. It's simply amazing. Uh, I love Colorado. I love coming back to Colorado. I'm now, of course, I've lived after 29 years in Mission Viejo, but I love coming back to Colorado to see things like that. I've got a lot of blue slides, too, that you're going to see tonight for the skies. Well, of course, it also provided us with the opportunity to maintain the facilities, to maintain the existing pasture fences, and things of that nature. Well, I'm going to go into the early years and uh, during that time show how we participated with the residents of the community. Today you folks could have come in and joined. Or with other Douglas County organizations that we worked with. The 4 inch and things like that that you'll see. So that was kind of the beginning of it. This is the development plan. This is the secret of Highlands Ranch. And I want to take just a moment to go to Planning of it was, this is the success of planned communities. Oh, I see. This is the success of planned communities, of Mission Vale, Lisa Vale, and particularly Highlands Ranch. This was in 1980. This is now when this gentleman and his crew had put together this plan. And the reason the plan works, it is not subdivision work, like so many builders and developers and things do subdivision work. They plan a portion, they plan a quarter of it. They took over a year to plan this entire piece of property. And you recognize, of course, today, the big circle there in the center, that's Highlands Ranch Parkway. This was back in 1980 when that was put in. You see the land uses. Now, one particular feature of this great community is the green. The green is the non-urban use areas of Highlands Ranch. And admittedly, that made it much easier for the planners and for the company to get this plan approved. Over 60% of this 22,000 acres is in a green category, a non-urban use category. It is not only the, the major southern part, and these are sections, that's a mile, that's two miles, three miles, four, are uh, in the non-urban use, but also in the areas that you folks would be familiar with that run through the community and across the community. Rec centers are located and things like that. And, uh, but, and we had the areas where the commercial was going to be, the light industrial, the, de the densities, where the higher densities were going to be or darker tones, the lighter yellow colors, uh, lower density and things of that nature. That, folks, is the reason Highlands Ranch is a success. Secondly, the reason was, I believe, Mission Bio's interface and with company with the community personnel right from the very beginning, with residents who first moved here in uh, the early 80s. 80s? Yeah. I was going to say 79, but that's when cattle came. Okay. Now you're going to see a series of pictures that are just primarily aerial views of the community uh, and back then, back in the early 80s. And that is, of course, the ranch mansion. Uh, right there in the center, 
before any improvements were ever made, and I want to add, I think what the district has done is fantastic. They deserve any bit of attention. Simply fantastic to come in to hear my answer. Now this is looking to the north. In the north, uh, well, let me locate you right now. You're in the center area right now. This is the mansion. The beautiful windmill structure down in the south of the mansion here in the reservoir. I love the blue color of that reservoir. And that's Denver up above. You see those green areas that I, you saw in the development plan? They're located in through here. They were kept open space. Here's the entry. It's all gravel, dirt road. And here is the ranch headquarters, the bunkhouse, and uh, the five a series of five barns, and the corrals. That's where our activity of ranching occurred. Now this again is a closer view uh, looking to the north. Now let's turn around and look to the south. It's a view to the south. You can see the dirt road entries. We did create that little parking lot out in front of the mansion that you see right there. And of course, you look to the south and you start seeing some uh, vegetation areas, see the green areas. You get to that point up there and uh, then it drops down. And folks, it's a beautiful area down there. It's got big ponderosa pines, uh, vegetation all around, some roads just like you see here to get through. Uh, Marvin Beeman is here tonight and, and they, uh, I ran the Arapaho Hunt Club, which is down in the southern part. And if you folks know, way down in the southern part of Highlands Ranch is a piece of property that is now operated by the uh, Douglas County Sheriff's uh, offices. And uh, But that down there is just, as I said, majestic ponderosa pines, scrub oak, and much steeper terrains and everything. But we still ran cattle down there. When you look at these flatlands, and they're great areas for grazing cattle, but we still had pastures. And in the summer months, when you didn't need too much attention, the cattle didn't need too much attention, we would open up that southern area for them. And by that time, the mother cows had their calves, and we knew they'd look after them. And so we'd open them up in the south. We had windmills down there and uh, plenty of water down there for the cattle. And so we go over that ridge line there, and that's where they go in the summer months. Summer months. This is looking now to the southwest. I'm, you know, folks, I haven't been, I've been away, I've been retired for 25, 7 years. I've been away for 27 years, I guess. I feel like I'm retired. And uh, this was the view to the south, and every periodically we'd go down to Sedalia, which was just opposite the sheriff's facility down there in that area. And uh, yes, we'd have a beer and our hamburgers down there for lunch occasionally. What was the name of it? Bud's Bar. Bud's Bar. Oh, gosh. I wonder if it's still there. Yeah. It is. Oh, I got to go tomorrow. OK. <laughs> yeah, and that, but that's. <laughs> they don't have enough beer. <laughs> Okay, and of course the view of the Rockies, which I love so as you knew earlier today. Here's an aerial view. You see the underside wing of the area. We're going to talk and be talking about some of these. Let me just point it out now because I'm going to show some other pictures later on of some of these corrals. Um, here's the big milk barn. Look at the size of that milk barn and, and the silos. And then there's uh, another barn, which is the machine barn, and the calving barn, and the cattle barn, and a horse barn. Yeah, and this was the bunkhouse where the uh, uh, branch foreman lived. And back here is another house in there where another ranch hand lived. And one other ranch hand, we had two ranch hands and a foreman. Foreman and two ranch hands lived there on the ranch. And they, they were the real success in it. I told you I was going to show more pictures of this. This is uh, a view. Of the, someone asked me earlier about a diagonal road that ran across the property. I wasn't familiar at the time, but I don't know. I mean, this is a diagonal road that runs south. You're looking south. I think the road he was referring to was coming in from over by Quebec and in this direction. 
But these pictures, I guess my favorite color must be blue, because I look at the water there, and you'll see several <laughs> other areas where it's blue. Water is so important, of course, when you're conducting a cattle operation, because of the cattle need their water, of course. Whoops. Here's, this is the East Ranch, Cheese Ranch. This is the area over in the northeast corner of Highlands Ranch. That would have been on the other side of, uh, I guess it's up in this direction. All the way over to, is it Quebec is the far side, and then you come over to uh, University, and uh, it's that whole north, west, northeast corner. And over there were, were facilities, and uh, we could occasionally doctor cattle there and brand, well, not much branding. We did that mostly right here. But we doctored some cattle. We had, we put cattle in different pastures. And here was, uh, as you can see, uh, ranch, ranch facilities. Here's the, the home and some out, outbuildings. And uh, so that was an important part of the ranch. And I would like to see that today, since they've been gone for 20 some years. But I'd like to see what is in that area today. I don't know if it's still there. Oh, there was a park. It's a park. Good. Fine. I'm glad it wasn't taken down. That's it. Okay. What did we do here when we were active with this cattle operation? I kind of put together what I think is simple, because it had to be simple for me, of a, a calendar of events. So I did it by activity, four basic activities. Breeding, then the calving, then doctoring and branding, and then the sales. Well, we start, let's say, this candle, uh, calendar with the summer in July, and we basically have maybe two and a half months, and we covered this period with the breeding. That's when we put the bulls in with the uh, retained heifers and the cows, and we had to watch them. The ranch hands were great. You had to go out and watch every day, make sure everything was going fine. And so they would breed. We put, everybody, someone asked, well, how many bulls you put in to how many cows. And I guess you could basically say it was uh, 24 for every month. No, Anyway, the calving started then, of course, following the breeding. And you can see, if you look at the cup, this one and the first blue one, it's about nine months. Does that sound familiar? Nine months for breeding. It is. It is really nine months and nine days, they say, that you can go anywhere, you know. And so we would consequently three there, three there. That was the calving period. And then in the summer months, we'd start here and we'd do the branding. We had a brand. Our brand was the Bar HR. You'll get to see some of those. The Bar HR. There was already a brand existing for Highlands HR, so we couldn't use HR, thus we developed the Bar above the letters HR. And each of those three were separately as you'll see later so we did that and we doctored the cattle and the calves at that time too we uh, would take the calves and, and give them their initial shots and vaccinations and everything make sure that they were healthy wasn't long after that that we then would take in the fall this was the time when truth to tell was. <coughs> we'd take them to the sale and we went first of all I believe up to uh, Greeley to a livestock exchange facility up there. And then uh, we came back and tried to learn a little more about it. And then we started taking them to Brush. Right, uh, Brush. And uh, that was, there was a fellow up there who got to know Bob Walker. And he was the executive in charge of the sale yard. And he made sure that he did his job. His job was PR like mine. Consequently, I recognized right away what he was saying, you know? <laughs> but he was the guy who then knew we had pretty good cattle. Why? Well, we had a lot of them. We had a lot of cattle. We're getting into the years when, I'm going to go into the numbers, probably uh, how we started out with lower numbers and built up. But he knew we were building up and we became a pretty good size herd. I'll say it, it got up to about 1,800 head uh, that we had and so we had to have the right number of bulls for those and, 
And it was, and he knew, and we were cow calf operation, not a steer stocker program or something like that, which was at least the Yale, I might add. But uh, we, he knew that we had these cattle, and we had good numbers. So he was interested in coming down and seeing them after the first year we were sold. We sold up there. And we'd take him on a tour of the facility. We'd show him the pastures and the ranges and how to, uh, how we did it. And so he liked that. He liked the fact that we were, came with good numbers and well-bred calves and cows. We sold cows up there too. But he, didn't, he liked that. And consequently, I liked it. And consequently, it worked well for all of us. But uh, I'll tell you what really happened. I told you earlier how we were always pleased and trying to extend out beyond to the residents, to the community, and to the county. Well, this, uh, the Livestock Exchange would publish a weekly newspaper. The sales were generally Wednesday or Thursday, and it'd come out published on Friday and be distributed the first part of the week following. And on that day, of course, who gets those? Oh, they have a good distribution. But lo and behold, the people that got them that came up and said something to us were the Douglas County Commissioners, through whom we were beginning to process the development plan. They figured, what is this group doing raising cattle? They don't know anything about it until telltale sales came, and lo and behold, they saw our cattle top the price, every category, in calves, in young heifers, in even the cows. They always topped them. They were bred well, and we doctored them well. And we were very proud of what we brought up there. And they understood that. He then came down more frequently to PRS and everything. And uh, it, it worked. It worked very well. Uh, we continued to go up there, and Bob was a, a good. What breed of cattle? I'm getting to that. <laughs> I knew you would ask that. You folks over there in the cattle business industry. <laughs> and, and let's get to this. Here's our ranch foreman, the corn, French foreman. Corn humor out there looking at the ranch. And you can see the cattle out there. Uh, here's some more. Stepping up. Oh, gosh. Oh, hold on a bit. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, we had Angus cattle. These are some Angus cattle, and you see they're both black and red. Uh, they're, and it, it's a very popular breed. Consequently, very adaptable to wherever they're going to go. These were the first type of breeds we brought onto the ranch. Uh, we have others that are around, but they, they, they're good temperament, good docility, and we were started. We were pleased with those to begin our herd. Oh yeah, they do. They're confused a lot of times. Okay, these are the limousine now. These are the, uh, uh, this is a French breed. And I'll tell you, I don't know why we really got these after I read about them. I was telling you about our consultant. He gave us all the technical information about it. He was so good, George Crenshaw. And he said, I think we should bring some limousine bulls on. So we, that following year, we brought on limousine bulls. To be. Here are some of the calves. You can see that they're... Their uh, characteristics, of course, I mentioned it's French. They're golden red to brown, and those are all very good color. It's average to good calving ease, which was important to us. And of course, good mothering ability. Let the mothers take care of them. Breed there's something to do that. So they were good, and they both, those were the two breeds we had uh, on the ranch. Am I not, am I not pressing this right? Point it, oh, point it over here? Oh, my, this is my son who lives here in Colorado. He's my techie guy. Okay, this of course is the ranch uh, foreman getting his horse ready to uh, saddle. I mentioned how important the windmills are. This is a windmill which is down here by the corrals, and that was needed for the corral, loca for the corral location. 
Told you I like blue. Consequently, this one got in it. Now here's another, just another day on the ranch. That's my picture. I didn't need to worry about that. But look and roll where we found them, right there by the windmill. <laughs> look at that. <laughs> yeah, always checking pasture conditions. He, uh, and of course, every good foreman has a good horse and a good dog. And they both went out and they checked their the ranch. Uh oh. Looks like we need some rain here today. Here they are doing their duties. Let's get ready to move these cattle to another pasture. They're out there looking up, looking at them. Oh yeah, we had to hunt for one every once in a while. We'd miss one, so we had to go hunt for them, and they found her. Now we're going to bring ourselves up into this area again. This area just to the east of us where I showed you earlier the activity really occurred. There are the milk barns. Uh, you've seen this, this is so identifiable. And you know, being community relations also, I had to incorporate community relations into the ranching operations. And so I, uh, Beth Nyhoff, who you're gonna hear from in a moment who was here, she would get with me and we thought, what can we do here? And this place, the front northern part of this, was we cemented in so it was all flat. Used to have the regular contours of where the cattle run off the be. We cemented in so it was all flat. And we put on a square dance. And we had a guy come in and just do a fantastic <coughs> community, early community activity, square dancing. Okay, the cowboys and cowgirls are gathering for the doctrine. Look at them all out there. Now you know I told you earlier we've only got three hands here, the foreman and two hands. But on this particular day, we were going to open it up to the community. We had a big event. And look at all those that wanted to participate. They were ready to go. And we had some bleachers. You can see some bleachers along here. Well, I'm going to show you people sitting in those in just a moment. But there's some cows and calves. They're going to separate the cows from the calves. Because this particular day, we're just working with calves, not the cows. And they were already branded, they were already branded, but we're going to brand and doctor the calves this day. We've done most of them already in the year, but this was on a Saturday, on a, a Saturday in, uh, I want to say June, May, June, June. And uh, this is what we did. We all welcome to Highlands Ranch. This is the day we're going to show you kind of what we do out here, folks. Come on out and see what we do. So you can see we had the banner up there posted for them. And uh, the young families are beginning to arrive. There are uh, a lot of young ones out here. I'm wondering if any of you <coughs> folks were on their shoulders seeing these guys. <laughs> this was uh, probably 1984, 83 or 84. Here they are, getting ready to look and check it out. Oh yeah, I'm always with a microphone. He'll tell you that. <laughs> and I'm up there already telling them where they should be looking for your best advantage point. But uh, we wanted them to have a good time. Now, I'm going to say you got to love those cow. You got to love those cowboy hats. <laughs> they, uh, uh, these kids, they were more of that age than they were adults, of course. And that's what we really wanted to see. Look at that, sitting up, sitting up on top of his dad's shoulders, drinking his coke, getting a good place to see. You can see he's in the front row right there. There's the corral posts <coughs> and the bleachers behind him. What right, is that? Lauren is next to him. Lauren. <coughs> Here? Yep. This is Lauren Rood. Donna Rood sitting right here in the second row of the front seat. Oh my gosh, see how you people know, that makes me feel good you recognize something here. Yeah, there's another real cowboy smile. I don't know, I just love these things. I just now there's another, that's a real cowboy. He doesn't have a smile, but he's a real cowboy. He came down, he would, always, he would oftentimes help. This time he was going to really help, and he was really the guy who was going to do the branding and just but that's his, his daughter there standing next to him and they were going to both participate in this day's activity 
neighboring ranches, that's where most of these people, as I told you earlier, came from to participate. They wanted to show the people what they do. Here's the, the this is the cowboy. This is the cowboy applying the Bar HR brand. You'll be able to see a little more. Yeah, it's a little smoky. Now there, you can see this cab's already been branded. There's the bar, the HR, and the people in the background. Bigger head, everybody invited. It's all morning event. We did this in the morning. Now we had hundreds of cabs, but this particular morning we just were going to do 100 because it was show day for the cowboys. Yep, they're all doing their thing. By doctoring, you mean the shots? They give them vaccinations. Yeah, they give them, yeah, they give them about, what did I say? Maybe as many as four, maybe as many as four or five calves, uh, four or five vaccinations per calf. And uh, so that's why they would hold them down. You can see there's three of them holding that calf down. What was the vaccination? Oh, it was, I don't know the particulars of it, really. I, if I did, I forgot them. Uh, I, I really don't know. Was that, had a, I, I, we had the vet. Marvin, Marvin, we even run the other gentleman back here who knows his cattle operation. But we, uh, we really, uh, uh, you'll see the vaccines, a couple more vaccination guns here. You can, you can see up here at the front, there he's applying the brand. At the same time, up here, they're uh, vaccinating. Now here's the vaccination gun that we would use. See that? Yep, there they are. Who holds the tail? Who holds the tail? Well, you really, usually the smallest guy. <laughs> usually the smallest guy. Right here. Yeah. Rocky Mountain is that the words? Yes, uh, yes, course. Rocky Mountain oysters. Couldn't have branding without the no, uh, we would be, We would castrate the bull calves right here at this time. And as we say, the Rocky Mountain oysters would be put in a pail, put in a pail, and uh, the ranch hands kept them most of the time because they, that was the reason they wanted to be there, they, the Rocky Mountain oysters. Here they are. Oh, here's three calves now. They got getting near the end of it, and we wanted to finish it up. So you can see there are three calves being doctored or branded part of the operation at the same time. <laughs> now I'm going to take a moment to pause here, and I'm going to invite I'm going to invite Beth Nyhoff to please come up. Beth, over here. Beth worked with Mission Yale Company. She was in community relations, and we, she could stand all day here telling you about each of the events that we did in the early part of the community. And of course, she was very active in this one, as other ones. I wanted her to take a few moments to tell you about uh, the particular meal that we served to the people who attended that day's event. Yeah. Well, I had the privilege and the pleasure of working with Art for six years. And uh, when I got hired, I had no idea what I was getting into. <laughs> it was so much fun. Um, and so this particular day, when we invited all the community, um, and it was in the early years, um, well, I have to back up. I was... I knew nothing about Rocky Mountain oysters. <laughs> and when I saw these cowboys, you know, castrating and plopping them in this bucket, and then every so often one of them would come along and spear one and stick it in the coals and just eat it. I would, it, was, it was shocking. <laughs> but that's not what we serve the people. <laughs> so, um, what we did is we were going to have a deep pit barbecue. And Art and his creativity and wisdom decided that right outside here, he would dig, he dug this huge 
pit in the ground. It was probably 10 feet by 12 feet, six feet deep. Had it cemented in just so we could do deep pit barbecues. So the day before the event, we would take an entire cord of wood, dump it in there, pour gasoline on it, light it, and it took hours for this wood to, to burn down to just coals. It had to be coals. And the Friday night, so this was on Friday, and then Friday night, we had to get the meat in the pit, and it all had to be timed so it would come out at 11 o'clock the next day. So Art and I and several others from our department, we would meet in the kitchen, and I would go to, I think it was Sam's Club at the time, um, and buy big things of garlic powder, chili powder, salt and pepper, and mix it all in these big bowls. And then we would take, they were like 25, 30 pound shoulder clods of beef, and massage this, um, all of this into the meat. In this kitchen? Yes, in this kitchen. And then we, I bought tons of heavy duty aluminum foil and wrapped these, these up. And then we had wire, uh, Art figured out what kind of wire we needed that was still bendable and we'd wrap the wire around it and create like a loop because we had to, he had a pole with a, a big long nail on it and we would lower these down into the pit that now has burning coals, take corrugated steel and cover them up, and then we'd shovel sand on top of that. Now, it's about midnight because <laughs> this has to cook for 10 or 11 hours. We want it to come out fresh. So we're all there with flashlights, we're shoveling sand, and Art is standing there saying, oh, I see a little, I see a little smoke. So we're shoveling some more. And finally he was satisfied and we could all go home and go to bed and get up really early the next morning because we had hundreds of people coming. And then, so we take, and I wouldn't sleep because I thought, oh dear God, what if it doesn't cook and we have all these people coming and what if it's not tender? And anyway, we would take all the sand off, take the corrugated steel off, get the poles, hoist, all these big shoulder clods of beef out and unwrap them and then the meat would just fall apart. It was incredible. And the folks would line up and we'd have an awesome barbecue. So I think that <laughs> So everyone would line up and there we are serving it up. We had the Highlands Ranch Activities Committee that would help serve, and we just piled it on. And there were, there were always certain gentlemen in the crowd that sit, would say, do you want to give me some more? <laughs> <laughs> so there we have it, and we'd spread out on the lawn, and it was just such a neat community feeling and event and time spent with the residents. It was awesome. So. Beth made things work so easy, not just this event, but all the events that the Highlands Ranch activities did, whether it be Christmas, Easter, Highlands Ranch days, she just went through all those and did all of those so masterfully. Well, I've mentioned a little bit about how we took our cattle to sale. Here is a picture of, of the cattle now coming up. Uh, we'd gather them in this little corral right next to the road up there by the barn, and we'd uh, get ready to take them, load them. Um, you've seen track going down freeways or highways, I'm sure, and you've seen the double trailer, the double high trailers with cattle in them, and wondering where are they taking them? It's to the sale yard. Here we're getting ready to take them on the bush. Who is it? Oh, I'm sorry, I got a wrong picture here. Uh, leave it up there. <laughs> leave it up there, he said. This is Jim Jeffers sitting up front, of course, like he always does. He was the president of the Mission Bale Company, our Colorado division. Now, the reason I wanted to introduce him that way is because, as I may have mentioned earlier, he was not only very good in planning, but knew the importance of community participation, community involvement in events, and consequently, 
he hired a novice like me to help him with it, and we somehow we worked together, and it came out all right. Because we, then we hired Beth, and she got it all straight. Okay. Uh, what we would do, what, as part of his extension, he says, Art, you know you do a good job here, you and Beth, in, in the community. I also want to extend that effort down into Douglas County. And so, uh, back in Mission Viejo in California, where we had a 4-H program right by the high school, he was very active in that, and uh, uh, he would go to the county fair and bid on uh, the items up for sale. And here was, a, here was the time when he said, Art, I want you to go down. He called me into his office. He says, Art, I want you to go down to the Douglas County Fair and participate in the sale, the 4-H sale. And I said, fine, that'll be fun. I like to go to fairs. And I will go down and uh, you want me to bid on the cattle? Yes, sir, bid on, the, bid on the steer. That's what we want. The steer is always the top animal to bid on at these fairs. Bid on that steer and make sure we get it. Okay, no amount of monetary amount was set, so I kind of said, okay. <laughs> and uh, we went down there, and Warren Huber, the ranch foreman, you've seen in a couple of these slides, and myself, went down there, and uh, we sat that Friday night in the grandstand, and they went through the various animals by uh, and first, second, third, second, third, and Third, second, and first was last all the time that they came up for the bidding. And it came time for the champion steer. And I'm kind of just going to show you a picture here of what a champion steer looks like. This was last year. This is 2014. That is a champion steer for the Douglas County Fair. Uh, I don't know what breed it is. It's the light colored, colored breed. But anyway, do you have any idea? Anyway, it was... Uh, well, you're close. It was, it's the light color, the color of Charlay, but I think he's got a little too much spread different color. You're close. I, I take Charlay, you win. Anyway, uh, we, uh, he says, okay, I came back the following Monday, and I was pretty proud of what we did. We got it. And the way you get those, if you've ever been to a Douglas County Fair auction for 4-H cattle, it's like a regular auction. And they go through... Uh, I now have so much, and I'm going once, going twice, and you get another bid. You're going once, going twice, and another bid. So we went through that four or five times, and there was a fellow up uh, on my right side. He kept bidding me up. I don't know if he knew who we were or he was bidding me up, and I kept bidding, of course. I mean, he didn't tell me how much I had to spend. <laughs> so I went, and we got it. We got it. I went back that next Monday morning, so proud, went up to his office, I says, Jim, we got the Douglas County Grand Champion Steer. Great job, Art. That's, that's what I sent you there for. You did it. Good boy. And uh, what we do with it, what do we do with it? We gave it to the, back to the fair with instructions to send it to uh, an elderly hospital in northern part of Castle Rock. I don't know the name of it now. And they were able to use the beef uh, from that champion steer. Okay. What happened next then was the next year comes along. So much fun, great time. Jim calls me on the phone. All right, come on up. Okay, I went up to his office. Going to the fair this year? Yeah, I guess so, right? Yeah, you're going to the fair. I want that champion. I want that champion. Well, it gets a little tight here. Uh, went to the fair and uh, French foreman is there and we're starting to bid, bid, bid. And there's another guy, don't know who he is, and he's bidding. I get going once, go, he didn't even go twice, he bid. And uh-oh, Warren, we've got some problem here maybe, and so I kept going, I kept going and going, and I was way up. I mean, whoever paid $3,000 for a steer, I mean, you know, you, we'd sell them, not that big, but not the champions, but we were selling steers for $400, here we are, $3,500 or something, you know? And I figured, oh, man, that's about as far as I want to go. And I forgot about what I was going to tell Jim. Oh, please. I forgot what I was going to tell Jim about it and everything. And uh, thank you. Excuse me one moment. Mm -hmm.
always like vodka. <laughs> So the next morning comes along, and I didn't go right up there, because I didn't have the champion steer. And he says, okay, Art, uh, do you get the chair, steer, champion steer? I says, well, Jim, we did something better, believe it or not. We did something better. What do you mean better? Jim, I had some money, I knew about how much. So what I did the rest of the auction was bid on the champion chicken, on the champion rooster, on the champion lamb, on the champion goat. I bid on, bid on all the, we got champions in everything. We were so marked up by everybody getting, my son, my daughter got this amount. And they were all, people started knowing that yeah, he'll bid, he'll bid, he'll bid. And I kept going up and up and up and sure enough. And so we made more positive points that day than we did the day before. Not the year before, but not to one individual. <laughs> he wanted that steer. And I'm going to end the story right there. <laughs> but uh, and we made buku points with the Douglas County people. Eventually, in fact, I uh, got to serve on the Douglas County Fair Board. Now we're. Uh, Marvin. Where's Marvin? Marvin, stand up. Stand up. Yanni, stand up. <laughs> it was so great to see these folks come in, and I was hoping they would be here because they are such a part of Highlands Ranch. Thank you, Marvin. Such a part of Highlands Ranch history. He's been up here before talking about the Arambojo Hunt Club, I believe, on several occasions. And uh, this is Marvin, right here. And that's not Marvin, that's George. That's, that's my dad. dad. Right there. And uh, that's, our son. Son. that's our son, Grant. Grant, Grant is right here, over here. Oh, wait. Yeah. That's Grant over there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. And that's, my, that's dad. Yeah. And that's your dad. Yeah. Oh, yeah. man. He on, is. On a horse named Bobby. And a horse named Bobby, listen to that. Are you folks getting the best of this? I am, I know. And here they are with their hounds. They, uh, for, for those of you who have missed their presentations in the past, uh, briefly, they would hunt, the season was essentially October through May or something, September through May? April. Through April, okay, April, that's right, because the hunt ball was in May. Right. <laughs> okay. And that was the winter months, because that's when the scent would stay on the snow. They didn't hunt in the summer because it was too dry and couldn't retain the scent. But uh, they, uh, they're out there on their, this, they had facilities today, the far south end of the ranch, uh, today where the Douglas County Sheriff has a, a facility, and uh, they hunted three times a week, uh, Wednesday, Saturday, and Sunday, am I correct? That's right. Wednesday was for the juniors, or was it for Saturday. the... Saturday. Saturday was for the juniors. Okay. Wednesday was the informal hunt. Right. The adults would go on an informal hunt. Saturday was for the juniors. They, a lot of these folks had their own horses, you see, so they knew how to do it. And then Sunday was the formal hunt. You can see them in their... These are in their outfits. That's actually a, a pink coat. Is that what they call it? Pink yeah, coats? That's right. I never understood it. I figured I was colorblind or something. But they were in their pink coats, their breeches, the leather boots, the leather helmet, and a tie. Uh, what do you call that tie? A stock tie. A stock tie. A soft tie. No, a stock tie. S T O C K. Stock tie. Yeah. Oh, I've never gotten that. I wore one. The reason I say that is because every May, they had a ball. And downtown, one of the best hotels, whether it be the Brown or one of the others down there, they would have a ball in May. Everybody would come dressed in formal attire. And of course, oh, I jumped ahead. I, I thought the reason I was going to hunt, was I going to hunt? I didn't ride an English horse. Uh, I've got the Western saddle, you know. I couldn't ride in one of those leather straps with iron stirrups and roll off or get something. 
So it turned out, uh, they said, uh, I, I, they asked Bunny, their daughter, asked me to join the hunt. Come on, I joined the hunt at one of these balls down there. I said, yeah, sometime. Well, the following year, she asked me again. And she had an answer for me. Well, I'll do it sometime. So you're not coming because you don't have the outfit. Or you haven't, you've never written English, have you? I said, right. Okay, here's what we're going to do. During the summer months, we exercise the hounds. They start out slow, so that when the hunt season comes again in October, they're ready to go. And they said, what you're going to do is you're going to take one of our horses, a horse raised right there in the, in the facility, who knew how to hunt, and they put me on that horse. In the, and they do a short run with the hounds. And they extend it a little longer and a little longer and a little longer. And I'd go along with them, and I had a fantastic time. But not good enough time to say, I'm ready to go. And that fall, when it came time to October, came time to go on their original hunt, being very full. I said, you know, I, I can't really go with you folks. I don't have any of that gear. They had me pegged. You know, in 10 minutes, I was over at their house. They had me outfitted. They had the, everything. Uh, the, the black jacket, the helmet, the, hand, the helmet, black jacket, bridges, uh, boots, and and horse. The main thing, the horse that was raised in the ranch. And so I had, I had to go with them. And I went with them on that first hunt, and uh, it was a party. They always have a toast with the. What are you toasting there? What type of drink? Stirrup cup. It, it, it's a stirrup cup. Stirrup cup. What's in it? Well, port. Port? Yeah, everybody drinks that, but the huntsman and the whip are in. Okay, good thing, good thing. So they all have their beginning of the hunt drink, and they're ready to go. And uh, uh, I'm there with, I can't even, I shouldn't even take a drink of this, let alone be on this horse. <laughs> on Sunday, this is the first ride, October, and it just happened. My wife, Pat, just stand up for a moment, just so they know. This is my wife, Pat. She, uh, uh, her folks came out that same weekend. And they're from Davenport, Iowa. They've never seen anything like this. And, and especially somebody they know riding in it, her the first time. So, your grandmother, would drive a big suburban and they would drive, she would hear where they were going to start out, go to this point, that point, this point, and then depending upon hilltop. hilltopping, they were hilltopping, and depending on where we were going to drive, or depending on where the hounds were going to go, uh, so they went up to the hilltop, up on a high, high hilltop, and sure enough, George Beeman took the hounds over there, and it was time to go ahead and we were right and I could see the suburban up on the hill. Oh my gosh, mom and dad are up there, everybody else. And now it comes time, oh my goodness, I have to go across a jump. And these jumps are along the barbed wire fence lines, but every in certain segments there'd be a, maybe a 18 foot section with log. Log one, log two, log three. And uh, they could lower it for beginners, you know. But I was right up there in the front because the horse was up there in the front. And the horse knows where he's going. Forget about me. And so he was right up there. And we're ready to go across this jump. And I see him up there. Oh, no. Oh, no. And so it came time for me. And first of all, uh, George goes over. Marvin goes over. Lawrence Spips goes over, and it's all in order. And then they looked at me, just because I'm up at the front. No, 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 no. <laughs> and they said, go get over, get over. And so I went back and they took off. Let's go. Zoom. We started going over, and my gosh, up and over. I'm on the horse. <laughs> However, we hadn't touched ground yet. We were crossing a fence like this, the downhill side. And he hadn't touched the ground, and I'm ready to hit the ground. And if you can imagine, I came down on the horse. The horse finally stopped. I took a tumble in the <laughs> horse. And 
There are moments of embarrassment I don't talk about very often. That's one. <laughs> anyway, let's get out of the list. Uh, I've got only one or two more here. Ah, uh, these are their horses. Look at those sleek horses. I don't know which one was the one I was on, but I'd go on any one of them because they were so well trained. They had uh, uh, such horses. And that, they were down there at the south end of the ranch. There's George Beeman, your father. George Beeman and myself. Right out here, right out here by the windmills to the south end of the side. One day says, George, come on over. Let's go up and get a picture. Now, someone here earlier tonight mentioned uh, the uh, polo match that used to be here. Also on the south side of the ranch, right next to where the hunt facilities were, was a polo field. And it laid dormant most of the time. And this is right, I, you could see it from South 85, right near Sedalia, talked about that. And you, they would uh, come in South 85, in on this road, which is right down here, and then they had they sold tents. You've seen these big white tents that they would have party tents, or maybe what do they call these white tents you go to now and buy food, uh, markets, and all all the fences are along this side, all the way the length of the polo field, and people came in the heidi tidy outfits that day, and we just really had a Fantastic time. They did. I did. Huh? In limousines, they limousines did. pulling up here. Anyway, well, it was the Denver Symphony Polo Match uh, fundraiser, and good for them because it raised good funnies for good monies for a good purpose, and it was held here at Highlands Ranch. We got our banner up there. Here's a couple of the polo players. Uh, the game is now underway. They're still scoring, and. Uh, you know, you can tell. I kind of enjoyed the time that I was here, can't you? <laughs> but uh, they had to send me back to California to perform some other functions. But this is where it was fun. And I just, and I think you can tell that from some of the pictures I've shown you this evening. Thank you, folks. It's been great. Uh, may we ask you to please come up here so that the rest of the audience can hear the questions? I guess if you want to ask questions... Did, did you have your own stairs or did you have a stud service for the, your Angus? Good question. Did we have our own bulls? Our own bulls. Our own bulls. Yes, we did. We bought bulls. Uh, that, I would use the consultant to go, and we'd go buy bulls. Can you imagine me buying bulls at a sale? No way. So we'd wait until he came into town, and we were going to go and go to some of the auctions to purchase bulls. He was the one who said we we're going to, what type of cattle we were going to raise. He was the one that said what type of bulls we were going to have and when we were going to get them. How many cattle did we have, maybe? Well, we started out, we were going to have uh, 2,000, 2,000 head, and the ranch would hold that, but we never got that high. What we did is we started out, we were going to go 600, 600, 600 each year and let the herd grow, but we started out the first year with 200, and the reason I wanted to start out low was we wanted to interface with the ranch hands who were here. We didn't know them that well. We want to interface with the existing ranch hands. They knew the ranch facilities. They knew the pastures and everything, the watering holes and how to make sure they worked. So uh, I wanted to start out slow. We started out a couple hundred. Then the next year, and we had, a, had 20 some bulls too, I guess, but the next year then we uh, bought the 600. And I always have to get this permission from this gentleman in front of course to spend that type of money. And the third year, on my program, we're gonna, we've got the next 600 head. But that was enough. Why was that enough? We'd reach our goal of we never got to 1,800 maybe. Because we were keeping our own calves, heifers, for carrying them over for the following year, and we would breed our own heifers. And they then would breed, and, then, and that's how we grew our herd to almost maybe 1,800, 2,000. When did they stop the cattle on two? All right. 
And when was the first house built? When was the first house the questions? A lot of people can't hear the questions. I'll repeat the question, I think. When was the first house built? And when did we stop cattle ranching? And when did we start cattle ranching? Stop. 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 Oh, I don't know. I stopped the second day. <laughs> no, it was, uh, the first houses were occupied in 1981. 81. Because, uh, and it was, I think, in October of 81, when uh, the first resident moved in. And it was right up there off Broadway. Hmm? Phil and K. K. Scott, first homeowners. I don't know if they're still here today. They were a couple years ago. Still here today, I love that. And then uh, they started to grow. The sales were going, going, and by the time Thanksgiving came around, we had, uh, oh, maybe 50? 30, 50, 30 families in the community. And we thought, you know, we've got to start our community program with these 30 families. So Beth, myself, Jeff Case, and Mary Putman. <coughs> Jeff Cabot, Jeff Cabot, Case is with the district. Jeff. And the four of us went to around to the community and they were dressed in pilgrim's outfit. And we, I was dressed as the turkey. You knew that, didn't you? <laughs> you did a guess. I was dressed as the turkey, and we handed a turkey to each of those 30 plus family residents that moved in. That was, those were the first ones. And then when did we stop the cattle? Yeah. Uh, I believe they're still running cattle, right? Well, yeah, they're still running cattle here. It's under a lease operation, but uh, we stopped in 19. Uh, 89, 88, 89, and because uh, that's when I was relocated back to the California operation, and nobody could handle my job. <laughs> no, so, oh, no, 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 no. Yeah, please come up for questions so that uh, we can use the microphone so everyone can hear what the questions are. And if a few of you want to line up, uh, please feel free to come up to line up. This is more of an acknowledgement of you art than a question. But my family and I moved here in 84, and there were several hundred families by then. And as best I recall, the, the motto, what Mission Viejo created model, motto was Highlands Ranch, your hometown. Your hometown. <laughs> so there were houses, Mission Viejo had funded the building of Northridge Elementary School and then did a lease buyback with the school district. The Northridge Rec Center was there and the people. But you were, you've been called the voice of Highlands Ranch and it may have been your position professionally but you really created the spirit that was the hometown. And I kind of think of it as the golden age of Highlands Ranch. And uh, I think you gave, probably presented me with that apple pie trophy that I won. In <laughs> she has it here tonight. Take a look at it, folks. She came up to me and showed me the apple pie trophy. It's amazing. So you were in the front lines of building that hometown spirit. And I'm curious to know about the cattle ranching. Were you um, hobnobbing with Tweet Kimball down the road at <laughs> Cherokee Ranch? She was a character. Oh, yeah. And she she grew, she bred different exotic cattle, but was there a partnership at all? Uh, Tweet Kimball, <laughs> fantastic lady. She uh, she was an adjacent ranch down here. I, I see you've got an opportunity to go on a tour to see the uh, her castle. By all means, if you can do it, do it. But pretty frequently, on Friday evenings, after the week's activity, she would invite me down to her place. And I wish there was a picture of it. There's a turret area that looks out to the west. And we'd watch that sunset go down. And right down beneath were the uh, were big cattle, the bulls. And she raised the Santa Gratuitas cattle down there. They are like this. She would go up to that one, couldn't reach the top. She put her arm over, and they got quite a hump on them, quite a hump on the back, and good-sized horns. 
and she'd put her arm around that big Santa Cruz. I would always stay on the other side of the fence. <laughs> but uh, let me go back upstairs. She loved martinis. Now, I have had a martini or two as well, but she made fantastic martinis. And we sit up in this turret room. If you see it, if you go on the tour, you'll see the room I'm talking about. Sit there and watch the sunsets over the Rockies. And then we'd go in for dinner. Um, I tell stories whether I'm supposed to or not. And one of them was we were having dinner, and they were preparing the meals for her. These folks over here prepared. And she was her cook. She was her cook. And uh, the meal was prepared. And Treat would sit at this long table with 18 chairs on each side, and she sat at the head of it. And I'd sit off to her left. There'd be the two of us. We had already had our martinis and came in, and it was time to eat. Now, when it was time to eat, it would be served and then you would leave because and there was just the two of us there to enjoy the meal. Lo and behold, we're a third of the way into the meal and Tweet enjoyed her beef not only to raise but to eat and she would eat, eat and she ate too fast and too big of chunks and guess what happened? She got caught. One got caught in her and she started choking and coughing and coughing. And I thought, oh my goodness, this isn't right, this isn't right. Now, I thought, Art, do something. What are you going to do? And uh, so I got up, went to the left side, the right side of her chair, got her up, stood up, and performed the Heimlich maneuver. Never having done it, never practiced it, just viewed it on TV like all of you have at one time or another, and boom, out it came. Talk about a satisfying evening. <laughs> He had another martini. <laughs> uh, I shouldn't do this. <laughs> you love to be put your armor on. <laughs> uh, I'll just uh, spend a couple minutes. Uh, there are so many things I can I remember naturally, and uh, at 87 years old, I'm, I'm surprised I can remember anything, but. Uh, Art Cook was one of the most fantastic guys, employed, not employed, I had no employees. I had friends. They were like, they were like family. I could cry right now because they were so great. Anyway, uh, I remember the first time I met Tweet. I went down there and introduced myself, and uh, I knocked on her castle door. My secretary had made an appointment. She opened it up. Mr. Temper? I said, yes. She, I know why you're here. I mean, never met her before. I said, why, Mrs. Kimball? She said, you want my vote in the planning commission? And I, I said, no, I don't. And I said, I just came down here to meet you. You know, you have the most beautiful red Angus I've ever seen. <laughs> that didn't fare very well. She said, Mr. Tepper, they're Santa Gertrudis. And I said, well, is there anything I can do? She said, yes. You can keep your damn cattle on your side of the fence. They're intermingling. Your red angus are mingling with my standard Gertrudis. Get them out of there. She invited me in for a martini. <laughs> we had a great time. But um, I just got about two more little things I want to mention. One is when we bought the ranch. We bought it for $26 million from Phipps. And I came down here the day we closed that scrub when it was at Broadway Gate. Just a steel gate. And Phil Riley, my boss, and he said, you know, you're over here, Jim, you're alone, but you got to do it. And I said, well, okay. And he said, here. And he hands me his car keys. And I said, what are those? He said, these are the keys to the ranch. I'll see you someday. <laughs> and then he took off back to California, and I'm sitting there with no staff, no nothing. And, but I did end up with a guy like this. <laughs> he is a fantastic guy. But anyway... I want to tell you, say maybe one more story about Art. He didn't know how to ride. <laughs> I can assure you of that, because after one ride, knock on the door. Here's Art. Can I come in, Jim? I said, yeah, come on in, Art. And he, he said, I'm hurting. I, I said, where? He said, in my crotch. And I had to give him a sits bath. <laughs> and, and, true story. <laughs> and, um, so anyway, but Art, uh, uh, there's so many things I could tell that would straighten out his story because they're so cool. <laughs> so,
so I'll, I'll end with that, but uh, it's truly been an experience. I, I gotta say, my daughter saying, cut it off. I hired Art to come over here to take care of personnel and of office services. After a month, or about three weeks, he came, I ordered him in and I said, come on in. I said, where are the desks? He said, Jim, I didn't order them. I said, what am I, I got no employees. I need to be sitting here on the floor doing stuff. And I said, where are the desks? He said, Jim, I don't want to be office services or personnel anymore. I said, get your butt out to the ranch. And that's all. But anyway, uh, it was a very fantastic thing with Beth and all the things those kids, I'll call them kids then, they did in making Mission Viejo or Highlands Ranch what it is. And I thank you very much, Art, for the fantastic job you, Beth, all your people did, and all the other employees that I had because we started from scratch. And you're living in what we created, good or bad. So thank you for all listening to Art because it's, he's wonderful. Thank, thank you, Art. I want to say a little story about when we first met you people and what my dad said. And we're so proud of what you did with Mission Viejo and Highlands Ranch. I'll never, <clears throat> I'll never forget my dad saying, oh boy, he said, I hope they don't make, let make this into a two or three or five acre patch and the horse will eat all the grass and it's just going to look like hell. <laughs> he would be so proud of what is going on. And thanks to you and your company and Art. And Art did a hell of a job. He maybe didn't ride too well that first day, but he did and sure did a good job. And the horse he rode was in that group of horses that he showed. And so, uh, thanks. Marvin Beaton. Marvin Beaton. Oh my goodness. Well, I think we're, oops, when, you're with the Associate you're with the Historic Society. I'd just like to remind everybody that Jim is going to be doing a program coming up in after the first of the year sometime. I'll have some stories to tell if I'm invited. <laughs> well thank you folks for being here this evening. I uh, I expected maybe a row and a half to be filled, and then thought, who's going to want to know about cattle operations in the history of Highlands Ranch? Thank you for being here and listening. Maybe it's a night out, and that's it. Thank you. Guys. Thank you all for coming out this evening. It was a wonderful program. Uh, another round of applause for our speaker. You did a wonderful job. Mind you, if you want to sign up for tours, those are in the back corner. And everyone else, just enjoy the mansion. And, and we'll see you uh, next month in Southbridge. <laughs>